Okay, looks like we are live. Um, hi, everyone, to our first ever series of Life After Islam. Um, and today we have a very special guest. But before I introduce her, actually, I'm going to let her introduce herself. But before that, <laughs> I just wanted to clarify what um, Life After Islam is about. Um, initially, this was meant to be a series of talking about ex-Muslims' journey and different part, but I thought, why not just hear it from other ex-Muslims who aren't, um, who don't do a lot of podcasts like Sarah and those who also do. Some some have a more private life, but also just learning and normalizing everybody's journey. We come from different places. We've had somewhat of a same story, but then, you know, we've gone in different parts and um, also, just helping um, understand that, you know, we're still living a normal life. Like, we have success stories as well. It's, um, you know, regardless of how mainstream media has put it, uh, we still have um, people like Sarah who are, have been brave throughout all of this. So, without further ado, Sarah, um, please introduce yourself. <laughs> Uh, hi everyone, I'm really honored to be there by the way. And uh, so yeah, my name is Zahra Umtada, Zara. And uh, I'm 27 year old, I'm a French Canadian and Lebanese. Um, I, my background is like Shia Islam and my family is pretty, they were pretty orthodox back in the day. Um, so yeah, I'm a mom and uh, I guess that's all I have to say about me. So French, Canadian, Lebanese, those are a lot of titles. Yeah. So I am guessing you speak different languages as well? English, French, Arabic. Okay. And were you born in the Canadian so the French part of Canada or were you born in Lebanon? No, in in, uh, in Montreal. So okay. in Quebec. I was born okay. there. And why I always specify like Canadian, French and uh, Lebanese is because I was sheltered and I lived in a very, like the Lebanese community is very tight. So I had a very strong uh, Lebanese identity. And I cannot just say um, I'm fully Quebecer, uh, Canadian. And the first time I actually interacted with white people, with Quebecers, people from this place, uh, was when I started university. And I barely got to talk to them, but I saw like they have their culture and I have mine. And it's like, I'm, I'm, I can't say I'm just Canadian. I'm French, Canadian, Lebanese. So when you said you first talked to white people, what about your surroundings? Like were, were your shopping malls or um, your restaurants all Lebanese? Like was it just they were in Canada, like you were in Canada, but it was like being in Lebanon? Uh, I think being in Lebanon would be better. <laughs> um, I guess when families leave the country and they come to like a Western uh, country like Canada, they get just more intense with their religion. And so I wasn't really, every time I would go to the mall, like we went to the mall, but it was always with my mom, my grandma, my family, um, like my sisters and uh, we're always taken together. No one, uh, we didn't interact with people just like maybe at the cash register, like, hi, that's the price. And that's my, my exchange. And restaurants is always, always halal restaurants. So basically always also Lebanese. And uh, so, yeah, I never really interacted, even neighbors, um, we never. So even your neighbors were Lebanese? No, my, my neighbors, uh, most of them were Italian at the end, uh, but uh, we never like interacted with them. Uh, we lived in a, a place in uh, Montreal where it's all old Italians. We don't really talk. <laughs> And I don't think they really all like this. Oh, wh why do you say that? Uh, when you're an Arab and you sometimes, I don't know if I should say this. Stigmatized? Uh, no, you're not stigmatized. I don't think they really cared at the beginning, but sometimes they would hear stuff that would make them believe that our culture is so different, they wouldn't agree on this. Um, like a, a woman screaming, for example, or something, and they would be like, "Oh, let's call the police." Oh, okay. okay. So I'm not right. going to go. No, no, that's fine. So just a cultural clash. And yeah. what about your schooling? Uh, an Islamic school from primary to high school. 
But and it wasn't like that intense. It wasn't, uh, it was a very normal, um, I, I don't know why they even called it Islamic. Yeah, did you not have any Islamic studies? Did you have to wear a hijab or was that, or like people could go to the school without wearing a hijab? Um, when I was in high school, in this, um, in this school, uh, at that time, you had to wear the hijab. After a while, when it, was, it happened when I left. Uh, it means like when I finished high school, I was 16, maybe I was 17, 18. Uh, the, I heard that the parents in school started to complain, like, why does my daughter have to wear the hijab? And now I, it's not uh, mandatory anymore to wear the hijab. But I might, in my time, it was. You had to wear the hijab. Yeah, and yeah. what about what about primary? Was this only high school that you had to wear the hijab? At uh, primary, no. It's when you enter high school that you have to wear it. But in primary, nobody cared. Okay. And um, in terms of, like, um, interacting with people, let's say the postman or people when you go to the shops, was that also limited or was that only on a need basis? Would you just buy things and just say hi, bye and go? Or would you actually go and ask, how was your day? No, we don't ask, how was your day? We just go, we buy, that's it. The mail yeah. mine comes, we don't even talk. Um, yeah. Because also for us, girls to not even interact yeah. with men. Yeah, so I yeah I guess because I've always known Canadians to be like Australians very friendly, and whenever I've met them, they've always been chatty as compared to different cultures. Like they're friendly and polite as well. Um, so I guess it was probably because you were from a different culture. But like, would it be different if you went to a Lebanese store? Sorry, I'm getting into more details about this. Uh, Lebanese stores are different because in Lebanon, even though I went to Lebanon many times and I stayed for uh, many months. Uh, but everyone is Lebanese, so it's different. It's like uh, here in Canada, I think they they will believe that the person is gonna hit on you if it's a man, and you're you may gonna you you may fall into their trap and want to date or whatever. Uh, it, but in Lebanon, even if it was an older man, yeah, th this is what they believe. Like he's gonna hit on you, he's gonna do something. But in Lebanon, because everyone has the same culture, so they kind of trust all of the community. Okay. So in Lebanon, when you well, even in Lebanon, I wasn't allowed to leave the, the house or anything. So I can't really, we, we could say hi to people, but we always like, in, this is what I saw in other people. They were, yeah. in Lebanon, they were more open. They were um, more free. They could, uh, I had my cousins in Lebanon that could take the bus and do stuff like this. I was never allowed to do this. My mom never let me. Um, so you couldn't take a bus alone or all of you or... Uh, no, if I if I take the bus with my sisters, that's also uh, forbidden. It has to be with my mom or like an adult. Okay, okay. and and how many siblings do you have? Three, three. Okay, and um, I'm going to get to your Islam journey soon, but I just wanted to understand a little more about um, how you first um, broke out into talking to people who weren't from a Lebanese background um, or more around from what you've told me before, um, you weren't really allowed to go outside the house? No. Uh, not even to the shops? If my mom was with me, yes. My, If I always talk, by the way, about my mom only, it's because my parents are divorced. So I live okay. with my mom and my my mom's family. Okay. Basically, it's all together with my uncles, my grandma, my uh, grandpa, my other grandma. And my sister, so we lived all together. My dad is in another province. I barely had any contact with him for like 12 years. I didn't see him. And also his family were like not close. Okay. Um, okay, well, that, that helps me understand. Um, and was your whole family, like even your extended family, quite religious? On my mom's side, yes. Okay. Um, the, the thing is, they don't look it. Um, they wear makeup. Uh, they go out like heavy makeup. But I think it's like the duality of being a Shia. Shias are more lax, it seems sometimes. So you will you will see women in Lebanon wearing the the Abe Aras, like the, the the kind of shadow, the, the thing that Iranian women wear, the yes. black thing. Mm -hmm. But they will do shisha outside. It's very normal. Oh. Yeah, it's uh, Shia are weird, but it's, yeah. it's good. You're more lax. So my mom, um, you look at her, her family, they're. They look really open-minded, like fashionable makeup, yeah. everything. But in reality, it's uh, very orthodox. 
Okay, so I guess they don't fit into that particularly, um, and I might get caught for it, like shown to be oppressive, like no makeup, hide your face. Um, so I guess a lot of people could also say it's their choice to wear the hijab because, you know, they have makeup on um, and they look very flashy. Yeah, but now for them, the hijab was always, uh, you have to wear the hijab. It's um, also like you can wear whatever color you want. You can. Okay dress in a way the way you want, but it has to be a specific length. Mm -hmm. And also something that I want to uh, note is that my family at the beginning wasn't really religious. Uh, like we used to listen to music and uh, at home was something we used to do in front of one another. There was no shame in listening to music. But with time, my mom got more religious and then she started to expect other people to stop listening to music too. So she insisted on her, even her mother shouldn't sing Fairuz anymore. Her, her brother shouldn't listen to music anymore. All the CDs were gone from the house. Uh, me and my sisters stopped listening to music. Why are you doing this? And uh, yeah, so it became like more and more. And at the beginning, we could dress kind of the way we wanted to. Do you know what pushed her to become more religious? Was it 9-11 um, because you were so close to the US? Or no. was it going on? Was there like a push from relatives? No, it's not relatives. Um, I think many, many things. Um, maybe she got more into the religion. Uh, she was afraid that she wasn't like following it properly. Uh, I also have an aunt, her sister. She's actually the first one that left Islam. Okay. And uh, maybe it triggered something in my mom. Okay. And when, what about you? When did you start wearing hijab? When did you remove it? I wore it about like, I think at eight years old or eight years and a half. And I removed it, um, I removed it at 20, 26 years old when I left. So yeah, 26 years, uh, a year exactly. Okay, um, and your relationship with your aunt, is that what, tr like what triggered you to explore? Um, did your aunt leave when you were very young? Was she shunned? Um, is that why you, there was a lot of curiosity? Um, my family was really good to hide whatever was happening with my aunt. So I wasn't really aware uh, that she had doubts because at the beginning, my aunt, she was Shia Muslim. Then she mm -hmm. became Sunni Muslim. And at the same time, she started dating uh, because she became like less religious. Mm -hmm. uh, but they never told us. I was still young. I was like eight years, nine years old. Mm -hmm. And after a while, I just know that she escapes and she came back. I don't, they caught her. They brought her back. Um, but, uh, we, I heard about her becoming like, she left religion and I think she became a Christian, uh, after a while. Uh, and I heard about this only when I was 19 years old. That's when I realized that, oh, my aunt, like I heard someone in Lebanon talking like, uh, is it true your aunt is Christian? I was like, what? I, I didn't know. And I faced my aunt, I was like, is it true that Khatu is, uh, my auntie is Christian? She's like, yeah, I didn't want to tell you. I was like, why do you hide? Like, why do you need to hide stuff like this? It's uh, it's irrelevant. I I, I want to know. And I didn't really have a good relationship with my aunt because my mom, the fact that her sister was so not really religious, she didn't want her to approach her kids. So I remember one time my aunt was next to me on the bed and like telling me stories and whatever. And my mom came, she's like, what are you doing her? Leave, don't, don't approach my daughters. And she had to leave. Wow. Okay. So do you think that she felt like she would put some ideas into you or instill some doubt? Yeah. 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 And were you, okay. So can you talk me through your uh, process of doubting religion? Um, I guess every ex-Muslim always had the doubts in his heart since he's really young. I don't believe one bit that it happens overnight. If you're an ex-Muslim, you probably had beliefs or questions since you're really young. So I remember when I was young, I used to ask weird questions, but I, I, I lived in a community where everyone was Muslim. I never knew anything uh, except being Muslim. And um, after a while, I guess it was like 18, 18, 19, I started to get more religious. I was um, at 16, I was forced to like not continue my studies and stay at home. So I decided, oh, you know what? I'm gonna get closer to God and that's an opportunity for me. Um, when I actually got more into religion and also at the same time mythology. So I got more interested in like mythology overall 
And then religion Islam was like, wow, there's like many sects of Shia Islam. And I and I got into it and I was like, what is Ismail? I never studied Ismaili Islam. I never heard about Zaydi Islam. Uh, and I got to know so many dis- different things. And um, I would always go on uh, Sayyid Khomeini's, uh, Sayyid Khomeini's website. And I would read the questions and the answers. I was like, I don't like it. I just don't like the content. And, so, uh, yeah. Were you, did you, did you give your tech lead to Sayyid Khomeini, like Ayatollah Khomeini? Okay. Yeah. At first it was with, uh, my family used to follow Sayyid uh, Muhammad Ahsan Fadlallah. He's a Lebanese, uh, mm-hmm. um, was it called? Mufti? Uh, I don't know. I, I forgot the, the, the term. There's like some differences in the term. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, they used to follow him. And I think I was the first one in my close family that turned to Khamenei because he was more kind of severe, let's say. And mm-hmm. when you want to, you want to have like a good, you, you want to see your limits exactly. You want to know mm-hmm. uh, where you stand in your belief in Islam. And, and Khamenei was more straightforward, let's say. It was, mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of like this. So I decided I'm going to follow him. And yeah. my family kind of like joined me and almost everyone else started following yeah. that. So just to give you, just to give all of you a little context, uh, context which she is, um, I think this is only the Twelvers that do it. Yeah. Um, with the Shia Twelvers, there are different scholars. And as you grow in, when you reach the age when you're a Balik, um, considered puberty, like, you know, considered an adult when you've hit puberty. So around the age of nine, was it nine for you as well? Nine. Yeah, so I think that I think that's a very sheer thing, um, nine, and you need to basically, um, yeah, that's right. You the mergers, yeah. Basically, you need to kind of select a scholar that you will um, want to follow with his rules. So they go in depth with like specific rules, and some people will have things like yes, maybe tattoo is allowed, maybe not on areas where you play, pray, and others will go, others will say no, we disagree. So I, with time, a lot of it can change and be challenged, but not as much to deter away from Islam's core, especially with like fasting. Um, And I think abortion was previously not allowed at all. And then a lot of the um, scholars, you know, started digging into it. They're like, oh, what if the mother's life is at risk and whatnot? So that's how we get a lot of um, our rules, specifically community wise. A lot of the community try or families try to follow the same one. Because that's what you were also taught. Because also it makes more sense when you follow, like sometimes different sheikhs, different uh, marja will um, uh, tell you, for example, today is the first day of Ramadan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other one will be like, no, tomorrow is the first day of Ramadan. Because you have like different ways of calculating the month of Ramadan. You can do it uh, without, not the ru'ya, which means like not by sightseeing. Yeah. You can do it by calculating. And I remember, well, I think it's Muhammad Hassan Fadlullah, the um, the sheikh that my family, the marja my family used to follow, he was he wasn't into like sightseeing. He was like you can just calculate it and you know when Ramadan is going to start. But Sayyid Khamenei uh, believes that you have to see the moon to uh, be able to. Right. It was always like one day behind. The the Eid we wouldn't celebrate the same day, so we decided it's better if we all do it like we follow the same sheikh, the marja. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, yeah, sorry, go on with um, your story of doubts and changing the mergers. Yeah, um, so yeah, I decided to follow um, Khamenei. And also my family are like hardcore Hezbollah supporters. And I was like, if you're with Hezbollah, why do you follow Muhammad Hassan Fadlullah? And he has like some kind of views on Saida Fatima and um, Omar and stuff like this. Um, he's, he's more nice and accepting. Uh, you have other scholars who is going to be like, uh, like they have full on hatred towards the Sahaba. Uh, mm-hmm. Abdullah was more diplomatic in his like his idea, his views, and everything. Mm-hmm. And I didn't like that he wasn't clear. So I followed uh, Khamenei. I thought it was better. Yeah. But I um, was, yeah. What mic are you using? My mic. My computer is mic. Okay. It's just I think when you're moving, it's hitting the mic. So, do you know where the mic is? Uh, I think it's outside. Do you hear oh, me okay, cool. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, wait. I'm going to close the, the window. Okay. Well, 
um, for all of those who are here while Zara is coming back. Um, at me with the questions that you have. We'll do it at the end. Um, we're trying to give this more to questions. I'm not going to be responding to comments. Um, also trying to keep questions relevant to her story um, and um, whatever, I guess, um, I guess following on Zara's stories. And then if there are any opinions or anything, should sh Zara wish to answer, um, that's up to her. Uh, we do have a question here, which I feel is relevant. No, not my family. They never did. But I know families who would, um, they would drink instead of saying, Bismillah, Allah ilan Umar. And they would drink. Every time. You sneeze, you sneeze Allah ilan Umar. Oh, wow. But uh, my family never did it. And it's not something that actually, it's the first, the only family I've seen doing it is this family. Never, ever have I seen Shia even talk about uh, the Sahaba. My, I never knew who was uh, Aisha until I was 14. Yeah, I think we did it, but only on the days that, um, I guess, Ali died or specific days about, I don't know, they have to be specific days, like the Battle of Badr or something, um, huh? when they cursed yeah. Aisha. Yeah, the, um, I think it's the, the Battle of uh, Jamal, Aisha I think against so. Yeah. I think that so. there there is some there is some like they don't they don't only cur like most popular it was um cursing um Omar wow. Omar Oh really? Mm -hmm. Oh not for us. It's always Muawiyah Shimer uh for the Imam like because they Muawiyah uh, as well for yeah. um Be Shimer because he's well. the one who actually did harm the the Imam Hussein like nobody else attacked him straight on like he did. So yeah. we're not gonna curse Omar and Abu Bakr and all this. We'll just say like, there's a dua that I, I remember. Uh, mm -hmm. We used to say, um, which means yeah. may God curse the people who- Tortured the Ahl al uh, Not only torture, it might be like, uh, didn't give them their rights. And that obviously includes uh, Abu Bakr, for okay. example, who refused to give the yeah. land that the Fatima owned. Yeah. Uh, after her dad, her dad died. So I don't know if people know about this. Yeah. Um, yes, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, it was about the door, wasn't it? Uh, no, the door is like supposedly it's Omar who. Uh, Omar? Yeah, Omar who. who Omar pushed the door. Pushed the door and like a nail, like enter her. Um, just, I don't know. He just, yeah. He smashed her behind the door and she lost her baby. And after a few days, she died herself. They even uh, say that he tried to burn the house, like he started a yeah, fire. Yeah, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, but I I don't know why because Imam Ali was inside. If he saw, they were looking. Ali. They were looking. They were looking for Ali, and Fatima was guarding the door. Yeah, but Ali was inside the house. Why didn't? Why did he just go? Why so did she it, was. Why did it happen? So the thing is, the what I was taught was that Ali tried fighting. Like he wanted to go outside, but she wouldn't let him. Because she knew that he was going to be poisoned or dead, like dead, or something bad was going to happen, so she stood behind the door, and then they came looking for it, and they took the door down. Ah, uh, the um, they believe that it, it was God's will. This is what God wanted to happen, so He didn't interfere. Yeah, um, it's 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 a very convenient way to yeah. blame God. God wanted me to die, so they are wrong. Yeah, Imam Ali can't do anything. Like uh, supposedly, he was very frustrated that this was. What was supposed to happen to his wife, but that's that's what God wanted. Yeah, so it, stories, you hear people being like, it doesn't make sense that Omar uh, tried to smash her behind the door. Why would she even open the door if her husband was inside? She's a yeah. woman; she can't yeah. open the door. So you have all kinds of opinions, uh, yeah. but mainly is uh, I think the person the Shia hate the most is actually Abu Bakr because he refused after the Prophet died. He had uh, a land. Uh, a piece of land that was his, uh, supposedly his. Uh, the money actually went to uh, Al Bayt al uh, uh, it's, a, it's a place where you just put all the money, the taxes that you receive from this land, and you distribute yeah. it to yeah. Muslims. And Sayyidah Fatima was like, My dad died, this is mine. And supposedly Abu Bakr mm -hmm. was like, No, I'm not going to give you this land, it's not for you. And he used the verse in the Quran saying that a prophet can, can't inherit, like, um, you cannot inherit from a prophet. So, Interesting. Yeah, she, was, yeah, she was upset, but 
I would tell to the Shia when Imam Ali became Imam, uh, like a Khalifa after him, yeah. him he didn't write this land to his wife. He had the, yeah. the, the, the like he didn't do it. So I feel like it just doesn't make sense, all this hatred towards Sahaba. Yeah, I remember yeah. bits of it, like, because I used to be an Islamic history teacher uh, when I was like 16, 15, when I was 15. So as part of your final year in Madrasa, you have to do um, Islamic law and then you also have to teach like kids <laughs> under grade five. So it's like you're a substitute teacher, but then like you just need to like be well, well versed. And I hated Arabic, so I never wanted to teach Arabic. So I went for Islamic history and um, was it, it was Dinyat and Akhlaq. So a lot of those. I'm um, so happy. I never had to to study Islam in my like we we the only things because my school was a mix of Shia and Sunnah and okay. the, the 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 man who created the school was a Shiraz Shia Iraqi and they kind of like the parents of the Sunni uh, students were complaining that you're teaching the Shia prayer and uh, why you're teaching the uh, and all of this so you need to like be more uh, diverse Generic. yeah and uh, your way of uh, teaching Islam. Uh, so I like the fact that it was very, um, you just learned uh, what is Ramadan, uh, yeah. what um, invalidates your fast, yeah. how to, uh, what invalidates your uh, wudu, how to do wudu. It was very general. Like it, my, my school wasn't an, an Islamic school. I, like it was Islamic, but it wasn't like, you know, intense. You didn't have to, uh, we didn't have to like, we had to learn the Quran sometimes, but students mm -hmm. really didn't do fuck we never actually did we, we would go at school and be like no i didn't i didn't even bother reading yeah uh, so i had islamic schools on saturday and then i was also in an islamic school but like i studied academics and quran was a topic in islamic <laughs> studies so with we also had prayer time where half of the room was divided for sunnis and the other half was for shias and then they would have like um like i think sunnis prayer earlier than shias like the adhan is 10 minutes earlier so yeah. they'll have different imams leading it. Um, so that was how, and I hated praying. Like I used to sit and I'm like, oh, I can't pray, I'm on my period. Or I don't feel like praying. And they're like, yes, you have yeah, to pray. <laughs> and I, I'm like, see, at, at home, my parents could kind of force me and I would pretend to. But like in school, it was like all your friends are there and you, you can argue with your dad, but you can't argue with your friends. Oh, at school, even my friends used to say this. So, well, like, I don't want to pray here. It smells like shit. The carpets aren't washed. Yeah. And everyone would be like, I'm on my period. And the, prof the, the teacher would be like, so you 10 girls are on your period? And we'll be like, yeah, it's actually does make sense. Like, I don't know why she thought we're lying. Yeah, we were lying sometimes, but you have a big ass school. You're obviously going to get at least like 10, 10 girls who have their period at the same time. Yeah. But yeah, it wasn't a problem to even like, you would say this one week, the next week you're like, I'm on my period. They can't really check, so they have no choice in saying, yeah, okay, whatever. And yeah. we never had like segregation between Sunnah Shia. It's more like guys pray first and then the girls. So that's it. Oh, so you were in a mixed school? Yeah, in a mixed school. Okay, we're allowed that... to get together in class, it's one next to another. It's, uh, oh, wow. Okay. So I was at a girls' school and then the boys' school prayed separately. They had their own halls and like we were like 10 minutes apart. Like if we, sorry, not tennis, but like five minutes, we could walk from one campus to another, but you can't do that. Like you can't be caught outside the campus. So sometimes I, I remember in one of the class I had a, I was, a, I brought my camera in because we we're doing a yearbook. So I had a pass to miss classes and go to the other side and take photos of teachers. Um, oh. I did not, I did not utilize it because like, I'm so scared of like breaking lines. If you know me, I'm like, oh, this is what we have to do. We're not recycling properly. <laughs> <laughs> sorry we, we have by the way my school we used to even like sports uh pe we had it mixed too oh wow no yeah yeah nope. this is why my school was really laxed um yeah it wasn't like any islamic school honestly it was really cool it's a, yeah. it's a shia school this is why you will never find i think a shia school that is too um intense I think ours was the most, I think we were, we had other smaller Islamic schools, but ours was the most popular one. And it's it was- Shia school? Like it was made by a Shia guy or is it? Um... Yeah. Yeah. So from the community as well. So we had a few other Sunnis or not community Shias, like the Iraqis, uh, but most of us were like from the community, um, mm -hmm. which was kind of embarrassing because everybody knew each other and, you know, a lot of and those were my only friends 
that was my world. Um, uh, kind of same with me too. Yeah. I had I had like I had lots of Moroccan friends. There were lots yeah. of Moroccans, Egyptians, uh, yeah. some Palestinians, lots of Iraqi, mainly Lebanese, and a bit yeah. of Ottomans. Um, yeah. They were really mixed from everywhere. We even had like some people from uh, I don't know. You had you didn't have really Afghans, but you would find like Pakistanis and stuff like this. Yeah. But it was mainly Middle Easterns and North African. Yeah. Um, sorry, just going back to changing mergers and like um, your seed of doubt. So when you changed, what caused the seed of doubt? Being strict. When I sh changed Marja or only when I... Uh, no, when so I your story from when you changed the Marja. Uh, yeah, I changed the Marja. I became more um, focused on Khamenei. And also my family is like pretty... A hardcore Hezbollah fans, supporters. Uh, so I was like, I wanted to be like them and I wanted to follow everything that Hezbollah does. It's like Hezbollah is managed by Iran, Iran uh, and it's uh, Iran itself is um, under the authority of uh, Khamenei. So I want to be like all in, fully. And yeah, once like I got more and more um, deeper into the religion and I started to dislike lots of things. Like one of the things that I disliked uh i was once arguing i was the type to go on the internet and sometimes if i see people against islam i would argue against them and be like no but islam is a religion of peace and uh, you know these kind of lies that you believe as a muslim it's like when when you have a muslim say stuff like this to you they're not trying to lie to you they just believe that this is yeah. what the peace is uh, and i used to believe it but then one day someone was like uh, who you um what sect are you from? And I was like, Shia Islam. I don't know about Sunni. Sunni are really hardcore. And like, I don't like uh, the Sunni Islam, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he was like, well, in your, in, uh, your sect of Islam, if you follow Khamenei, uh, Khomeini, in Khomeini's book, you have, you have him saying that it's okay to um, uh, basically like have sex with a newborn. You can. It's not, it's not illegal. Like usually when you do, you commit adultery, when you sin like this, you're killed, you're lashed. But when you when you rape a girl, the only punishment, like it's literally written in the book, that is only between him and God. That's it. And he just yeah. did something. He pays her uh, at, uh, the money of the blood, we call it. You just pay her this, and she's considered your, uh, um, like your, uh, your, his, he, she's your responsibility forever. Um, and I was like, no, this is a lie. That can't be true. And I just send a message. You can actually send messages to the uh, Maktab. It's it's the bureau. I don't know how to say it. You send them messages, and they reply. Like you have a question regarding religion, mm -hmm. they will send. They will like um, is rabbit uh, meat haram? Um, yeah, haram. They will be like, oh no, it's ha it's halal or it's haram. Can rabbit? I eat it? It's actually haram for Shia. Islam. Yeah, so we weren't even allowed to have rabbits in the house. My brother, he he saw mm -hmm. this poor man selling rabbits, and he's like. I want to give you money and like I also don't want to see them go around. So she's like, I'll buy it. And then my mom's like, they're going out of the house. And I'm like, mm. we uh we never really bothered with animals except like once we had a dog. Yeah. But okay. we, uh, gosh. we never kept the dog inside the house. It was more like uh uh in our garage and because my uncle just loved yeah. dogs. But it depends on the families, honestly. I think she always will, will only say. If you keep them out, it's okay. But like, yeah. Uh, yeah. you can have birds, I guess, when you're a Shiite. It's not a problem. You have a lot of families with birds. Uh, but yeah, so I sent a message to uh, the, uh, they have a website uh, for the, the it's, it's called Istifta, which mm -hmm. means send the messages and religious questions and they will answer you. And uh, I was like, is it true that in, uh, in Khomeini's book, this is written? Um, and they gave me a long ass response that yes, it's halal if uh, because in Islam, the the age of marriage is when you consent is at nine for a girl, fifteen for a boy. Mm -hmm. But before this, because you're not uh, Rashid, you're not mature enough to give your consent, so your dad can give consent on your behalf. Whether you're a boy or a girl, he can marry you off to someone. So you're a guy who's eight years old, your dad can marry you off to a, a woman or two or three. And how you, it's, and it's, how it's, you, it's in Islam. I don't know. Um, I think in uh, Sunni Islam, it's uh, like this too, but I'm going to talk about Shia Islam because mm -hmm. this is like when I realized this was halal, I was like, this is, it's unfair. It's, 
you, you cannot, you cannot just tell me that this is something uh, you would accept. Nobody would accept this. Yeah, and I, uh, I was so shook to my core that in my religion, this was permissible. You can actually marry a girl. So in, in cases where you have poor families and a man has two, three daughters, he doesn't want to take care of them. He finds a suitable husband and he can marry off the daughter as like at one, one day old, he can marry her off. And this is when they explained to me like the maktab, the, the, uh, the people working with Sayyid Khamenei, they explained to me that this is halal only when the guy is married to this uh, baby and then he has like ownership over her. It's, it's haram to penetrate her uh, because she's too young to uh, be penetrated. But if he hurts her in any way, if he, um, if he makes her bleed or she, she almost dies, whatever, she's hospitalized, he has to pay money for her and she is his responsibility forever. And uh, it's, his mistake is between him and his God. Um, and yeah, she's, uh, she's considered his responsibility forever. She's like a wife, but she's not a wife. So he can marry four women and she's kind of like in a, the, the, like a sex slave. Yeah, the status of a sex slave or a concubine, something like this. Wow. It just didn't make sense. And I still have them, the screenshot in my emails and everything, that the response itself. It just shook me to my core that something like this was even accepted. And they, it was the first time, usually when you send them questions, they answer with like one sentence, two sentences, like this is halal, this is haram. But this time they went into like details and where does like this come from? And as uh, Imam Jafar married his daughters this way, uh, this person did it this way too. Imam Ali did this, so it's okay in Shia Islam. And we can't go against what they do. We can't make it haram because the Imams did it. So we have to to um, keep keep like we have to keep these rules alive, even now in the twenty first century. You know, I know. Like, uh, sorry. And did you find other marjas disagreeing? I, I spent a whole year being like, you know what, maybe it's only Sayyid Khamenei. And I spent my a whole year just looking at other uh, maraja and it's, it's just part of Islam. It is just part of Islam. And every time I would talk to someone about this, they would be like, yeah, but it's, would you do it? I was like, no. I was like, yeah, everyone else, nobody would do it. So what's the problem? It's like, the problem is it's here. It's here. And nobody's saying, no, we have to remove it. The problem is Islam is something that will never change. It's like, it's eternal. And, and as long as you have this rule, you will have one day someone who will actually do this to his daughter. And you will never be able to tell him you've done something wrong because it's, it's, it's halal. And that's my problem. But nobody was able to comprehend this. Do you think they just ignored it because it wasn't popular? Yeah, like, I think done. I've heard of like this happening. Uh, but I remember one day my mom was like, I know a girl, she got married like this to a guy when she was really young. And then she she went into uh, puberty and she was already married. And because she was already married, so she could have sex with the guy, basically. And she got pregnant at like really young age. And it was totally normal. She would play with them outside and she would be like, yeah, I'm married. I have a, I'm pregnant. She was like 11 years old or something. Wow. And, and she told me really normally this story. Like, it is. I mean, where would you find stories like this? I mean, I never, I, I guess... I guess much like you, there was nobody around me that was married at a young age, except for like the 16 and 14 year old who had finished high school or got pregnant um, out of the wedlock. Um, and then their parents would marry them. Um, and it usually happened in mostly the Arab culture where they would marry right after high school and they're like 16 or 17, yeah, like yeah, right yeah. after high school. Um, did you feel like that was the case around you? Yes, I would have people in high school just dropping out of uh uh, of high school altogether because they got married, especially the Iraqis and the Lebanese, uh, Syrians too. So yeah, it was us. Um, I feel like the North Africans, they really didn't have this in their culture. You have to study, you have to finish your studies to get married. Before this, you cannot leave your school. Um, but when it comes to uh, Lebanese, Syrians, uh, Palestinians, Iraqis, oof, you get married like 14, 15. 16 you're out of, of uh, high school you're married you have two two three kids this is like and even with me i my mom told me that i was going to stop high school and she she made me believe that i was going to go into college it's uh we call it sejep here it's two years before university she made me believe that i was going to go there she made me register 
enroll in, in the classes, pick my lessons and everything. And then the day before, she was like, no, you're not going. You, you really thought I was going to let you? Because oh, I, yeah. she, she, she did this all. It was all just a facade, just to make me believe that I was going to go there and to avoid having me complaining. Because at one point, she brought it up when I was in my last year of high school. And my teachers, who were North Africans, they came to talk to my mom. They were like, you can't just force her to not continue her studies. They were Muslims, hijabis. They were like, you, you just can't tell your daughter to stay at home and not continue her studies. She's just 16. She has to go to college and, and study. So she, she, she said yes, and she, she made me enroll. She paid for everything. And then just uh, like the first day, the day before I went to, uh, it was after the entire summer. I spent the whole summer in Lebanon, and then the day before I went to uh, college, she was like, no, you're not going. You you think, you really believe that I was going to let you go, and she didn't let me go. Did she have an excuse? Did she say what you were meant to do, what you were supposed yeah, to do? She didn't want me to mingle with uh, non-Muslims. It was going to be my first experience with a non in, an, in a non-Muslim environment, so I was supposed to just stay home. Like if She, she told me if there was... A Muslim sijab, I would have sent you. There's no Muslim sijab, so you're staying home. Do you think other women in your area also experience this? Yeah, my entire cousins, all of them. My entire family. Uh, They all dropped out of school at like 14 for no reason. They're not even married. Some of them are not married. Some of them are married. Uh, So yeah, the parents are like, what's the the point of you going to school if you're going to get married and not even work? So you just stay home. Do you so think- all of my cousins, I now, after I left, my family kind of uh, they realized that you shouldn't do this to girls, just suffocate them this much. And now my sisters and my that are staying with my mom now they're continuing their studies. Now they're in university, and now they take the bus. Now they are allowed to have a proper life to breathe and not suffocate. It. And now because of this, I have some cousins who are going to university. That is awesome. That that is what. That is awesome. You caved, really you know, you, you paved um, the pathway. That's amazing. Way, but at my expense too, I wish they were just not assholes and just allowed this to happen in the first place. Because you send your girls and you see nothing is happening. They're continuing their studies. They're all hijabis. They're somewhere in their hijab. They're proud Muslims. And what are you afraid of? Why did they do this in the first time, in the first place? Why was I not allowed to even step out of my house? In my time, when I was with my mom, my, my family was extremely orthodox. They were extremely uh, strict. And like I couldn't even, if I went out of my house, uh, I, w- I had to say close enough so that if my mom would like just yell my name, I have to hear it and, and uh, respond to her. If she wouldn't hear me, if I was a bit far away, she would, uh, she would just jump in her car, drive around to find me. Where the hell were you? And stuff like this. So... It took years for them to allow us, me and my sisters together, to just walk a bit around the, the, the neighborhood and enjoy ourselves. That took years. Yeah. And what did you end up doing when you were dropped out of your college uh, education? I stayed at home. I did nothing. I, um, when I, the last year of high school, I was, uh, my mom took us to Lebanon and she made me meet lots of guys. So I had a panoply of guys like this. I'm like, you choose. And you get to sit with a guy here and there. And now I don't like him. You, it's like swiping left in real life. Like, I don't like this guy. I don't like this guy. And uh, I picked one guy that seemed the nicest. And uh, I had a, yeah, he was my fiance. He became my fiance. And um, I came back to Canada. My mom was like, you're not going to you, to college. And I was like, well, at least I have a guy. Maybe if I get married, I'm going to have a better life. And uh, I, he, he, I did really like him at the beginning. I was, I was really in love with him. Uh, but that was, we ha- there was a distance, uh, three years not seeing him. And also uh, there was like, we had the flip phones. There were no smartphones back then, no applications, no mm-hmm. WhatsApp. It was just like one message a day or two, and that's it because he had to pay for it. So, and he would sometimes go um, to like internet cafe and talk to me there. Um, and we we had this me and him for a long time. And every time I was like, "Can you talk to him? Uh, can you can you talk to my mom and just allow me to continue my studies?" Like I had to ask him to convince my mom 
that she could let me go continue my studies. But he was like, no, my uncle, uh, he's in Canada too, he's here. Uh, my uncle told me it's a bad thing. His son is always saying that you shouldn't, you shouldn't continue your studies. Like his son goes to college and he sees all these girls mixing with guys. I don't want you to continue your studies. So you stay home. And I was like, oh, like I have no choice. I just, I'm going to live my life being a, a housewife. That's it. And it's okay if you want this, but it's not okay if you're forced to do it. Wow. In, uh, uh, it's just echoing. It's what? Okay, is this better? Okay, yeah, this is better. It was just echoing. So whatever you were doing before. Okay, this is better. Yeah. Um, wow, that must be so sad. Like I, I have shivers because I was, I was raised quite differently. Um, I had to, I had to push for my study, so I had to go for it. But it was never marriage. It was always like, well, you'll just work somewhere. You don't need a degree. You just need connections. But how do you, how do you feel now with, um. I guess opening that part to your younger siblings, your cousins, and um, them not getting engaged, and you know, being I guess I guess a role model as well. Even if they don't see you like that right now, you're still you're I like you're my role model. When I first heard about your story, I remember the time we were uh, video chatting. I was like, oh, I was still in the shelter back then. <laughs> Sorry, I was still at the shelter back then. The first ever. Uh, yeah, call. yeah, you were at the shelter. So tell me more about what happened. So we'll we'll come back to this in a bit once you finish your story because I feel like there's more you can add to it. But what happened after? Um, I guess you met the guy at sixteen, yeah. and you had a long distance for three years, so nineteen. And is that when you went over to Lebanon? He came over. So I know a bit about your story. So I want yeah. everybody else to hear it. It's uh, I'm nineteen. It was. It was only like engaged before it was uh, a non-halal way. It's like just he asked me uh, for marriage and I said yes. And then at 19, uh, because now at 19, I can legally get married in Canada. So uh, well, 18, whatever. So they, they took me to Lebanon and uh, we got officially married uh, religiously. Um, but it, it's like um, you're engaged, but legally you're married. Uh, in so you were to become it's it's kind of yeah you 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 could actually how can i say it's like a wedding it's like be islamic marriage you're married that's it okay and we took uh pictures of like marriage and whatever to uh start working on his visa when i came back to canada but just to make it clear for people um it wasn't that i was married islamically speaking i was married but i wasn't allowed to like have sex for example or stuff like this because you cannot get pregnant you're not living with him and it's like very it's taboo in the society that you're not living together and you you're sleeping together um the thing is what she had do is you do the marriage papers you sign the papers everything religiously so you can go out together you can sit by yourself and like enjoy each other's company but you cannot sleep together like i wasn't even allowed to go to my in-laws and sleep there with my in-laws I had to see him during the day and he had to drive me, uh, it wasn't Lebanon, so he had to drive me back to my mom's village. And uh, so this is how I spend my time. Um, and it was it was sweet, you know, um, at the beginning when you're engaged and uh, yeah, it, it was nice. I, I thought like, maybe I'm gonna have something good. And that uh, was your first interaction? Uh, was what? Sorry, and that was your first interaction with the guy? That was my, yeah. Because you, do you have headphones? I don't have headphones with the uh, mic. Oh, that's fine. Uh, you, oh, you can you can you can you put the headphones on and still use your mic? Because that will help with the echo. Okay, wait. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, I mean, her story is it's well. By the way, I know she is probably listening to this, or will find out about this. I am writing my book. And it's called Faithless Hijabi, and Zara is going to be one of the person I interview for my book. So I feel like her story will go beyond my book, um, but I really definitely want her for my book. I'm interviewing five women who have grown up in different areas and different places and can contribute to what is um, testimonies, biographies, and basically draw the parallels of it. So it's themed, and Zara will be one of the person interviewing so i'm really really excited that's why like 
this podcast wasn't even planned. It was basically me asking her the day before. And I'm like, I really want your story out. Like, I can't hold it in. Um, I, I just like, when I first spoke to her, I was like, oh my God, you're amazing. Like, I want to be you when I grow up. Um, and I think we're the same age. Um, 27. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I can't really hear you. Can you change your mic? Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's better. Just closer to your mouth. Okay. Yeah, I have a mic, actually. That's good. Perfect. Um, what were you saying uh, again? Um, oh, I was just saying um, that you are um, being featured in my book. And also, like, I have always looked up to you. And you're like, when I grow up, I want to be you. And I'm like, I want to be her. So why? I remember like the first time I heard of you, I was like, look at her. Like she, she managed to continue her studies and to go places that she, she saved up enough money to travel. She had a, a job and I'm like, wow, I had none of that. I, I feel like I was, I was, I mean, I feel like I was quite lucky. I was given, I had to push for it, but it wasn't a battle. Sometimes it was sometimes like my parents wanted to get me married um and they said they would my dad said he wouldn't pay for my tuition and my dad is not a person who is like very strict he can be very strict but he like he's very movable if you give him a good argument or if you cry a lot you'll get what you want so Aww. that's how i that's like but because i was always really nice i never had to cry a lot so whenever i ask even now if i ask my dad for anything um he, i would get it um so yeah um oh. No, my, my case, it wasn't like this. And the thing is, this is what I mean. You were stronger than me. I, I never faced my mom ever, ever, because I always felt like I owe her so much. She raised us, me and my daughter, my, my sister is like a, a, a woman on her own, um, raising kids. She had me at 18. And I was like, I can never just face my mom and tell her, no, I'm going to do whatever I want. Fuck off. Like, so I just couldn't ever imagine myself doing this. Um, I finally did after years. But yeah yeah at I that mean, time no I couldn't like she told me you don't continue your studies you stay home I was like okay I stay home I don't do anything yeah and also my family all lived together so when you have your uncles your grandpa everyone just telling you you have to obey your mom like look at the sacrifices she made for you you can't just go against her and you feel the pressure so yeah yeah I, I, do anything. I, th I think we're raised very similarly where you know my 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 dad uh, sorry, my parents, both of them, or if any of had argued with my mom, she's like, I carried you for nine months. And I always felt guilty. Um, I felt guilty for anything, like even posting a photo without my hijab, even if they knew. And my mom was always like, I know you're not wearing the hijab because you're in a white people country and you'll be racially attacked. And I'm like, I'll take that. I'm like, I'll take that. <laughs> um, so she would get annoyed if I ever wore short sleeves or post a photo. Um, but then at the same time, like when I went back home to Tanzania just for a week, my dad's like, you can't live in my house not wearing a hijab. And my mom's like, she told my dad, she's like, if you want to leave the house, you can leave the house, but she's staying here. None of my kids are not welcome in the house. That's okay. the boldest my mom has been. She's a mama bear. At the same time, she gets, she internalizes a lot. So she, she, um, I, I posted a video about a man burning a Quran. And she couldn't confront to confront me about it. So my dad called me later. She's like, I want you to remove it. And I'm like, just read my comments. It just says that I wouldn't do it, but I respect his um, right of free speech and he shouldn't be killed. That was my stance. I don't see the point in doing it. There's a different, I know there are all parts of blasphemy, but this is not me. So I think like my family have evolved quite a bit and my mom was never a battle. My, they're, they're quite, they're not assertive. So if you had to ask anybody in my family who would win any fight, they'll point to me. Like literally, I remember telling my cousin off when I was like 16. And she's like as old as my dad because my dad was young. And my mom's like, I would have never done that. And I'm like, nobody's been to my parents. And I just left. And I'm like. But that's, no. that's good. <laughs> that's good. That's just, I think. Um, when you have when you have uh, both parents and you have like the dad who plays like the really severe role, for example, the typical uh, families, and you have the mom who's very uh, loving and everything, yeah. it's different because my yeah. case, my mom was on her own and she yeah. had to be very strict. So I don't remember like during my, my childhood, I don't really remember her being nice and hugging us and stuff like that. She was very strict. And yeah. to be honest, um, 
my my mom went through a lot uh, can you imagine a woman on your own no job yeah. nothing uh my dad was, was not nice to her he was very yeah. mean to her they, they had their problems and he just left her with three kids he didn't support her at all and she was pregnant he she had like me my two sisters and then she um she had like she was pregnant with her uh, last child and he just left her and my mom had to she 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 couldn't live with her family at first because they had a small apartment so we had to uh she had to rely on like social welfare and mm -hmm. yeah she went through a lot so i understand when in the morning she felt like she couldn't even wake up because yeah. i have this now and but i have one son she had three girls uh, three girls and and she was pregnant and she gave birth like going through the divorce and my dad was uh, adamant like i don't want it uh, I don't want to divorce you until you give, until you give up your rights, your mahir and all of this. Um, I want you to give up your uh, your right to have your mahir until uh, and and then I'm going to divorce you. And she wait, had what is divorced. what does a right to give up mahir mean? I'm not familiar with it, so I know uh, what mahir is. Yeah, bride's uh, prize or yeah. dowry. Yeah, because there's the adam akhar. The adam is the the mahir that you give when you get married, and it's mm -hmm. usually a Quran, a bit of mm -hmm. gold. And the ma'har is the ma'har that you will get if you get divorced. I think okay. this is something that is very typical to Iranians and Lebanese. I'm not sure if mm -hmm. like anyone else have it. If if you do, just tell me. Yeah. The truth. But my the ma'har basically is the divorce, the the money you're gonna get, the ma'har you're gonna get when you divorce. But if the woman decides to divorce, most of the families are like religiously you have to give her whether you she wanted to divorce or the guy wanted to divorce. Yeah. But a lot of men actually just like insist on the woman uh, like if she wants to divorce they're like i will divorce you if you give up uh, your right to have the mahr. yeah and the woman if she there's there's nothing wrong in islam to like uh, if the woman gives up her right to the mahr mm -hmm. so if she says no i don't want it anymore the sheikh or the, the whoever is making the, the divorce paper are going to be like yeah okay whatever and they just mm -hmm. sign the divorce papers for them but when um so yeah, so th this is basically what usually happens. And my mom didn't want to get divorced, but my dad wanted. And in the end, because of whatever he was, like he, he was being very difficult with my mom. And my mom was like, you know what? Okay, I uh, if, if you're staying away from me, if you don't want to divorce, uh, and the only reason you want to divorce, uh, the only time you want to divorce is when I give up my mahar, I'm going to give it up. She gave it up after I think six years or something. Wow. Yeah. And... Uh, yeah, so she gave it up and um, she finally got her religious divorce. Oh wow! Yeah, wow that that must have been a struggle. But yeah. sorry, go go back to go back to um, coming back from Canada. The um, oh yeah, I I got, I got the, married religiously get, there. Yeah. Uh huh. And he stayed there. I just came back with the pictures of the marriage and the proof and everything. So I applied for a visa for him, and two more years, and he got accepted. Um, so yeah, it was three, five, okay, five years altogether. Yeah, five years of us being apart. And in between, I just three months I spent with him. And during the time when I came back, when I was nineteen, uh, now I had smartphones. Now I had applications. Now I had mm -hmm. he had Wi-Fi at home, and we could speak more often. And there were some things that would kind of annoy me in his uh, character. But I was like, it's okay. I'm gonna get over it. Like. Uh, being in a couple is like you struggling and just figuring out things. Um, but he came to Canada and once he came, he I saw another side of him. Like he, just to prove that he was a man, he would do things. Like he would tell me, I promise you, I'm going to take you to pick, for example, the, the furniture for the house. But just to prove that he's a man, he went there by himself. He wouldn't pick up my calls, nothing. And he's just like, I bought everything. This is my system. This is how it works. You deal with it. And he would do like, I, I am home cannot leave my bank card he took it everything it's i was completely under his control my my wedding everything he decided for everything wow i, I couldn't even like even my name my son's name i didn't pick it up he he forced it on uh, on me and basically his son so i had okay. i feel like i had even less control over my life than when before when i was with my mom like at least with my mom she's She's tell my mom sometimes if I want specific things or whatever, mm -hmm. I can just tell her, you know, I can, I could at least go out with my sisters and have a walk. Like after a while, she would allow us to do this. But with my uh, husband, I wasn't allowed to leave the house at all. 
we had like a, a drugstore right in front of my place, like right in front. I wasn't allowed to go there. And if I went there, he, and also I, I didn't have money at all. Uh, so if I, I had to beg him to give him some money so I can go and buy something, like I need toothpaste, whatever. I just want to go and walk. I had to beg him. And then when I go, he would tell me to give me the to give him the receipt. He would look at everything. Why did you buy this? Why did you do this? What is that? Like he was extremely controlling. And I would see him in the morning, like I would wake up to see him like going through my uh, wallet and whatever money I had, he would just take it for him. So he was, he was very extreme. I had, uh, I, I was just living, basically just cooking, cleaning and having my, I had my baby and that's it. Uh, that's it. I, I had nothing else to do. Uh, paying bills, stuff like this. I had, I, I, I wasn't living. I had no idea what, what life was. So like if I had to leave somewhere, I had to call him, I'm going out now. And he works really, like really close by. So he could just drive by and see me outside. So it was really, um, at that time, but, um, I, I had big doubts. And mm -hmm. um, when I was pregnant, this is where my doubts were like extreme. I started to really, um, I really started to disbelieve in Islam. And um, during that time, my aunt who disappeared, who became a Christian, she came back. Like they found her again because she was, she was unfortunately dying from cancer. So what happened is that um, I saw her and I was like, oh, so she's Christian now and whatever. And I saw this side of my family. Uh, usually they were always like, oh, uh, the, the other religions were accepting and blah, blah, blah. But then you have your, your own daughter who's a Christian and you're abusing her verbally all the time. Uh, and I saw this really dark side and I was like, this is all lies. My family does not accept stuff like this. In Islam, uh, for example, you're gonna, people are going to say, oh, but that's your family doing this. That's my family abusing her. That's true. In Islam, nothing says when you have a daughter who's, uh, or a son who becomes a Christian, you have to bully them mentally. But in Islam, because she's a Christian, whatever my grandpa wanted her to inherit, he, he didn't write in her name. She didn't get one thing, nothing. If she would die, she, she died Muslim, like she converted at the end just for the family. But if she died a non-Muslim, um, she would have inherited nothing nothing and it, well not if she died if she if she didn't become a muslim she still if she lived and my grandpa died she would have inherited, inherited nothing this is what you get when you leave islam you get nothing from your inheritance you you're you're basically just wiped from your family maybe you're they're going to be nice to you but is, islamically speaking they owe you nothing you will get nothing so that's wow. in a way that's also abuse yeah, wow. Um, that's that's crazy. So, has your grandfather passed away, and is your aunt a Muslim now? She she's the one who passed away. So oh, okay. It does, like my it, it didn't change anything. In the end, she didn't get anything. Uh, but I'm saying like if she stayed alive and my grandpa passed away, uh, as a Muslim now she is entitled to something to inherit anything. But if she wasn't a Muslim, if she decided to stay Christian she wasn't entitled to get anything you're not a muslim you do not islamic speaking you do not get anything wow but she passed away i was still pregnant like she stayed i i saw her for like a good five months and uh and yeah she passed away i was still pregnant and when she died that was the day i actually disbelieved i realized like i wasn't a muslim i stopped disbelieving for a long time before this but this is the day i realized i'm not a muslim the day my aunt died, she was being like she was being buried. She was being washed and everything, and I was. Um, it's kind of a mosque, but they do the ghusl for for the maid. Uh, the mm -hmm. Washing so, of the dead. Yeah, so ghusl is washing of the dead. Yeah, they they were like distributing uh, like little Qurans, and you read the verses and whatever, and they're like, "This is like you read this, and her soul is not going to suffer." And I was like, "Why do I need to read this so the soul of my aunt?" like doesn't get burned or doesn't suffer while you wash her because supposedly if you misbehaved when you get washed you're gonna feel like you're burning your soul is gonna burn every like every drop of water is uh boiled water for the soul and i was like but what did she do like she didn't kill anyone she didn't rape she she basically she was a good human being maybe yeah. she did mistakes but the, the she deserved to be like punished to this extent by a god and I was like, why do I need to calm him by reading a Quran? Can't he just deal with his own emotions himself? And I was like, 
why is God just this fire that I always have to throw water to calm him down? He can he can calm down the fuck himself. And I just remember I closed the Quran. I was like, I'm not reading this shit. He, if he wants to get pissed, he can get pissed. And I came back home and I was like, yeah, I just asked myself, if if Muhammad came now with the Quran, would you have believed him? And I was like, no, I would have never believed him. That's that's bullshit. And I was like, oh well, you're not a Muslim. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That was, I think, wow, that was an intense story. Um, sorry to hear about your aunt. Um, was she unhealthy or was it like... Cancer. Um, she had cancer. Long cancer. Okay. Is that why you think she may have converted back? No, she converted back because my, my mom and my, gra my grandma and everyone basically, but especially my mom and my grandma were always harassing her. Like, you're stu like she's, she's dying. She's always on uh, morphine. She literally yeah. had at home a hospital bed, a thing yeah. on her uh, shoulder, like um, her medicine. She couldn't even take them anymore. They had to so do she had dripped it. Yeah. 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 And uh, they would harass her like this. They would be like, you're stupid. Who, who would believe in a trinity except stupid people? They would yell at her. My mom took her Bible. And uh, like one of the last things she told me the day before she died, she was like, can you find me in my mushaf? And I was like, the Quran? She said, no. And I was like, oh, shit. She's actually still... She's Christian in her heart. She, she, my, the day she converted to Islam, I was there. I was sitting at the table. I came for a visit. And my mom and grandma just verbally talking to her and, and manipulating her and abusing her. And she was like, all right, yes, I was thinking any way of becoming a Muslim again. And uh, my grandma was like, really? And she came behind her. She told her to say the Shahada. And she said the Shahada. And my grandma was like, and And my aunt was like, like she had a period my aunt when she went against Shia Islam and at that time she said it really forcefully and mm -hmm. my grandma was just so happy that you're a Muslim or you're Shia too so um, yeah she she said this and uh, I remember like she looked at me. my mom was hugging her my grandma was like oh I'm so happy I thought my daughter is not going to be buried in a Muslim uh, cemetery and I was like, that's that's the thing you say that's that's your worry I was just so shook, like the change. Suddenly they came to hug her after she she converted. Like, ah, oh, now you're nice to your sister and your daughter. And I was just looking at this. I was like, the fuck is happening? I felt so bad. She smiled at me, my aunt, but she was like, she had tears in her eyes. She didn't look happy. And I didn't know what to do. I remember like one day my mom was verbally abusing her and she just cried. My aunt just cried in my, my, uh, my, my arms. Shoulder. And I just told my mom, just leave her alone she's moaning she's she's in pain why do you need to talk to her like this like the woman is dying who cares like who, who is going to convert someone willingly to islam doing this kind of like with this kind of behavior i think they just i think it's their fear that their sister that like my aunt is going to go to have to hell because she's not a muslim so it drove them to be like this with her that's still not acceptable. It's not a, a good behavior to have. Like she, she suffered all for her life, and especially her last few days. Wow, that's that's intense. And how old were you at the time? I was uh, twenty. Was twenty-two. You're twenty-two. Yeah, and 22. did you say you were pregnant? Yeah, I was pregnant by then. Okay, and you basically officially left Islam when you were twenty-six, like 22. when you can. No, twenty-two. 22. Yeah. Okay. When she died, that was the day. She was being buried, and that was the day. Like I realized she's not a Muslim. Uh, I'm not a yeah. Muslim. Wow. And neither was she, apparently. Yeah. Because when yeah. she asked me this at the end, like you, you, when I asked her, like you mean the Quran? She's like, no. And I was like, oh shit. So she's still Christian. She, and did she you did Quran. you give it to her? Because I I feel like I'm in a movie yeah. and I need to know the answer. I would have given it to her if uh, I knew where I was. I think my mom, I don't know what she did with it, but I remember one day my mom was like, what do I do with the Bible? Do I burn it? But I feel bad to burn it because it's still a, a religious book. And I was like, mama, you cannot burn the, the Bible. You just, you don't burn a Bible. You, you hide it or you give it away. But why can't you just leave it to her? She was like, no, no, I don't want her to like get these ideas into her head, these uh, non-Muslim ideas. So That's I don't know what happened to it. Wow. Okay. Well, that's horrible. And then from 22 to 26, when you left, um, what was that like? What was your journey like? You obviously had your child. Yeah. 22 to 26, I had, I was closeted with uh, ex-Muslim. So I, uh -huh. I was hiding and I was living in a, I was living a lie. 
uh, with a husband who was constantly uh, on my back, uh, seeing the prayer mat not moving, because um, I wasn't praying. I had to fake praying. Like even before, because I, I realized I was less religious, I prayed, but most of the time, I, like I would pray once or twice a month. Like that was when I had my doubts. Um, and uh, then when I realized I'm not a Muslim, really, I'm not a Muslim, this is when I really stopped praying completely. And uh, my husband would realize that my prayer mat isn't moving. Um, even when he would come back home at night, he wouldn't see me praying in Muhrib Asha. Um, and yeah, he saw these changes in me. And sometimes I would like give some, I would criticize some things. And it made me rethink everything. You know, when you leave Islam, some, some ideas, especially when you're from a specific sect, some ideas that were, you were born into, uh, you start doubting them. So you have, you have uh, more critical uh, thinking. So I was like, what about Hezbollah? What about Sayyid Khamenei? What about his way of thinking? What about this? What about that? Is it actually, is it acceptable? Is it right? Is it wrong? Like, this is how it was. I started doubting everything. And um, yeah, it was like uh, me being traumatized, being like, I left Islam and I was like, wow, life is different now. And uh, yeah, I was, I was closeted. I had my baby. I remember in the hospital. I, that was my one time where I was like going against the rules. I refused to wear the hijab when I was in the hospital. Because anyway, I had to wear the, um, the, the hospital gown and it's like short sleeves. And I, tell, I told my mom and my, uh, my husband, like, what's the point of me wearing the hijab when I'm wearing short sleeves? Who's, who's going to look at a woman who's given birth? And, and like, what is the point behind this? And I was like, I'm not wearing the hijab. I'm not. I'm not. They couldn't say anything. That was the first time. And I was like, I can actually have control if I'm assertive. That was the first time I realized this. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, um, I had to get my son circumcised. And I remember, like, it was really traumatic for me. I was against this. Um, and then I grew up. I was like, maybe if I just hide that I'm an ex-Muslim and I just please my family, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be better. But it was harder and harder to just go along with it. You are basically living a lie. And for your mental health, it's not good. I was so unhappy. I was so unhappy, extremely unhappy and depressed. Um, and what, about it, what about it made you unhappy? Because I feel like I'm going to pass this link around to a lot of other women. But what about living a closeted lie, especially being married and not with your parents, uh, made yeah. you unhappy? Uh, the fact first that I was so sheltered when I was with my uh, my husband, I in the first place I lived really far away from my family, I couldn't see them often, and then I had only me and my own thoughts and my depression, so it made it even worse. But also the fact that he was extremely controlling all the time, telling me like, why are you not praying? Why are you not like this? Uh, the fact that I can't even express like we're watching something, and I want to say reply to anything, and no, you're shut down. Whatever you're saying is wrong. And the fact that you, you just, you're just hiding everything inside you. You have to dress a specific way. I, I, one of the first things that I did outside uh, as a sign of rebellion was uh, to not wear socks anymore. Like, imagine not wearing socks. That's a sign of rebellion. And I got shit for it from my ex, from my mom. They were like, how dare you, don't, you, you, you do not um, wear your socks? Like, your toes are going to be seen. And I was like... Who cares if some, someone saw my toes? What is it going to do? My face is uncovered. But why can't I uncover my, my, my toes? Like, what's the point? What's the logic behind it? And it just, it's, it's Islam, it's Islam, that's it. Khamenei says you have to hide your, uh, your toes, your whole feet, you have to hide, that's it. And I hated this blind follow, following. Like, if you want to do it, you do it. But if I don't want to do it, why should I do it? And then I was like, what if I get a daughter? I, I wanted to study, I wanted to do things, I wanted to at least work to get out of the environment I was in, be less controlled. I didn't get any of that, nothing. I was to obey, to do whatever was expected from me. It's always like you have to, like the expectations, that's it. You, you follow the rules, you make us happy. It's not about my happiness, it's not about what made me comfortable in my life. It's always about what my, my husband wanted. And uh, like even the, the kind of uh, fabric I would buy, like the cloth, the, the fabric, he would co comment on it. He was extremely controlling on these uh, things. And when I would say something outside, uh, whenever, he, he decided everything. Like more passive than me at that time, you would, you would not find. 
extremely passive. I had no control in anything. I just hated how I looked. I hated everything. I had pictures that I uh, once posted on uh, Twitter of me with the hijab before with him and me after I left. And you can see, you could see in my eyes the unhappiness. And even sometimes my mom, when I would go to visit her, she would look at me and be like, are you, are you feeling okay? And I was like, even you are not saying that I'm not happy. Even you are not saying that there's something wrong. How, how can you expect me to just always, it's like a triangle that you're trying to fit into like a, a, a square hole. It's not going to fit. It's just not going to fit. And I, I started to see how abusive he was. And I was like, oh, that's a very a normal thing in our society. And I'm not happy with this. I, I think I deserve better. And um, I stopped loving him. I used to be really in love with him. Uh, but then when I saw the abuse, and especially the, the thing is I was blind to the abuse because in our community, it's very normal. It's absolutely normal. Uh, when I left, for example, one of the first things I was told by one of my husband's cousin was, uh, so what if she's unhappy with you? All of us are unhappy with our husbands, but we have to stay because we sacrifice our, uh, ourselves for the sake of our families. And I was like, no, I'm not doing this. I'm, I'm, if I sacrifice myself, I'm going to sacrifice my kids because my son is going to grow uh, in a family where the mom is obviously unhappy. If I have a daughter later on, she's going to have to wear the hijab. And it's, what about when she asks me? What about the, the, uh, the con consequences of having people from two different faiths and living together and me not being able to express myself? Uh, what if she, she's forced to get married at 16 like I did? What if I lose my mind and just um, like try to force everyone not to do this to my daughter? We, you have to think for the future. It's, it's just not a, vi a viable option for me to just stay with my ex. It, it, it wasn't anymore. I didn't like the way he was too controlling. I just decided that's all. It's done. That's it. I just want to add, do you know why, like this is to the audience, do you know why I said I want to grow up and be her? Look at her. She's, she's amazing. You're brave. Um, you're, you're, you're just amazing. Like I have tears in my eyes, so I'm really trying to hide it within like this eye. Um, <laughs> but like just hearing everything, it's just like, I, I start crying when like, when this girl Aya Hashem was shot, the Lebanese girl was shot and I just started crying and I'm like, other people just killed her. Yeah. Like they just killed her. Um, there was a question here before. It was, why is Zara, so you, why are you surprised at your husband's reaction when he moved across to Canada when a lot of Muslim men are known to be that um, controlling, abusive? That's true. But I was surprised because he didn't seem like it at the beginning. And then I saw it. Actually. Okay. So that was surprising. Like, I feel like it was a, another person. I saw his real face. Yeah. Um, well, I come from a different background, but um, with like the Muslim men in my life, being my dad and my brother and an ex that I've dated. Um, well, with my dad, he wasn't as controlling. He wasn't very controlling. He he was like his, his word was final, but now it is not. Now things have changed as if they've grown older. My brother was never controlling. He never has been. It's always like he is assertive and whatnot, but now he's understood that it needs to be a balanced relationship. He is getting separated for different reasons, but like even as my brother, he was never really controlling. We had, I think, two or three fights in our whole life that I can remember. So he is always like, I think he is like a perfect example to me as um, a good Muslim man. Like he doesn't have to, he, he does pray and everything, but in terms of following the archaic beliefs, he's not. So I always, I always like my brother for actually putting rationality first before religion. Um, so I don't think it's all Muslims. It's definitely prominent in some cultures. Um, definitely, I have heard about it a lot with a lot of women, so it's not unheard of, but I've also heard about a lot of women who have lived amazing um, free lives, and it's very dependent on family, not just culture, it's family, but in general, I personally feel like religion does give you dominance, um, yeah. does give men dominance over women, and it's not established through the inheritance part, it's established through like things like you can't say no to sex, you can't do this, you know, a mother's like, you know, the, the, the whole fact that your dad is the one to decide for you everything, it, it yeah. just shows the power dynamic in, in religious uh, um, like in sec, sec, how sexes are viewed in religion. So you yeah. always have the man 
as the god of the house. He's the one yeah. you have to obey. You cannot like leave the house without your your partner's uh, your husband's opinion um, permission. Uh, your dad is the one who even when you get married, even if he agrees, like he's like, yeah, I I will allow you to get married. He has to sign the papers. Like he's responsible for you throughout your life. So it says a lot. And it's just like the fact that in Islam, um, you give such power to the men. Uh, even if some men are going to be way, like they're going to be very open-minded and, uh, you know, nice, genuine, nice people. Islam will give an excuse to these bad guys, these like, uh, these fucked up assholes. Like they're gonna, it's going to give them an, uh, uh, an excuse to be the way they are. So if a woman is being beaten by her husband, um, Islam will not really, really take the side of the woman. They will say, depending on why he's beating you. But that's itself a problem. It's not depending. You do not beat anyone. You just do not approach anyone. You just don't do this. And um, for example, for be beating itself, um, I, believe, I believe not all Muslims, um, when you see one Muslim uh, or like someone just saying this verse is about beating a woman, actually beating, I am sure that these people inside them, they are actually psychopaths. There are just people who are violent in nature. And they're also using this uh, verse to justify their behavior. But when you see someone who's not violent, even if you have this very clear violent verse in the Quran, they will change it into something like, oh, it doesn't really mean this. Because inherently, they're not like this. They will never raise a hand on their wife or their kids. So they see this verse and they're like, I could never do this. And I, I don't, I cannot just uh, rationalize this. So I cannot believe that God will ask me to actually hit my, my wife. Therefore, it doesn't mean this. It means something else. So Islam itself is a set of rules. And we really need to differentiate between Muslims and the actual Islam. And people don't always do this. They think, they think in a very fundamentalist way where Muslims live uh, like they em emulate the, the Islamic rules in their day-to-day -day life, but that's not how it is. A yeah, lot of I'm, Muslims do not, beating, do not like beating their wives. They're against this. A little more of what I've been reading and studying. So I've been doing a lot of psychology, studying, reading articles and whatnot so I can help other people or just disseminate a few ideas and healing from my own religious trauma. So a few of the things that I have been doing is understanding how people can differentiate from another person's identity. Or can you still be friends with a Muslim knowing that they follow a religion that, you know, that once you did? Um, and how can you treat somebody different from that? Like, can you, like that person, that Muslim itself, not just like the religion may want to post their dead, but can you be in a room with a Muslim who actually believes that and approves that and would kill you? Like, can you actually, and I, I think I found it really hard because I had a therapist who was a Muslim um, I found it really hard to open up to him, even though he tried, you know, talking about it and talk about religious trauma. But at the same time, I remember that I had spoken about something in my therapy sessions, which was Ramadan. I wasn't fasting. He was because clearly I didn't see the water like on his table, with, which I usually do. Um, and I was talking about blasphemy, but like, I don't believe in this. Like, how could he be so mean? And he said, touch wood. I don't think I could ever go to the session again because I was like, I had tried to see you differently, which is fine because you were great. A lot of parts that you, you know, you took, like you took and understood, but you can't completely be like separated from your Muslim identity. So I feel like um, there are, it, it is quite hard to separate people from their identity, yeah. but it is bigoted if you just start putting groups of people together into what is a violent or maybe the true version of Islam, because a lot of the people, like my family, do not know what apostasy punishment is in Islam until now, even after I've been out for three years. They do not know. Even with blasphemy, when I was talking to my dad, he was like, oh, um, yeah, well, they shouldn't be killed, but it's not nice. Maybe jailed. And I'm like, but, you know, it Why was, it was still, yeah, exactly. But I, I don't think he said it, but he said there was a court case going. And I'm like, and I just wanted to talk to my dad. And I'm like, but do you think it's okay if it's his book? Like, it's just a book. You you carry it to, like, a higher standard. They don't. And I don't think they should be killed. And that is my premise. And he was he was understanding. He wasn't opposing. Um, but he I think to him it meant, like, I was promoting that idea. And I'm like, I think you should read up the text, like, my comment for itself. 
But sorry, back to you. I have a question. Uh, we've gone over an hour and a half, like almost an hour and a half, which is great. Um, it was about around the timing that I really wanted with you. And I would love to talk to you um, again. Um, I would love for uh, you to come on um, the advice corners as well, um, especially talking from like your background and how you yeah. were trapped as well, which will be a more, um, if somebody, if like I haven't introduced this, which I will, I am not a podcaster. I've never done hosting before. This is my first time. But uh, with advice corner, we want to do wait, a short. I, t I took your first time. Yeah, you're my first. <laughs> you're my first. You are definitely my first. And I couldn't have like i just feel like from here like i am so excited to just like have more women talk um i know there's a lot of risks to it because you're then putting yourself in the way of every attack that yeah. you know all of us have been getting um but yeah you were my first um so we'll talk after this <laughs> um but we are going to do advice corner with me and somebody else i'll announce later um it's not very much planned we literally decided a few hours before this podcast so i'm really excited which will be um half an hour or even less specific advice on specific topics and then answering a question or two um and then something else that i'm trying to introduce which will happen in a few more months hopefully if i have the capacity is doing more resilience building with psychologists um, so I want to talk to more psychologists and talk about specific aspects that especially ex-Muslims or people who have come out of religion can adopt to then people like yourself who have been living closeted. How, if you can't move at the age of 16, what do you do when you don't believe? Like, what are some, uh, things that we can practically do to empower you and like make you feel like you're supported? So basically give you the tools to grow. So that is my plan. It is a lot. And I really hope it grows and please subscribe and support us and follow Zara as well. But I do have a few questions. So I'm going to pop them on the screen. Feel free to read it out loud and answer it. The, 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 um, that were, do I have to read the name and everything? Uh, no, just go. Um, okay. uh, just answer. Okay. Uh, so I, the, there were Masumin. Uh, no. Uh, during like, when I was an ex, when I was a Muslim, I never really like it. It wasn't an important matter. I didn't care. Uh, but at one point, it did come up, and I was like, if if they're masumi and like infallible in the first place, it doesn't make them special. Like God made them infallible. So what? What do you expect? Or why do you venerate them? But I never, um, no, I, I never like stopped believing that they're not. It, it wasn't even um, an essential matter for my disbelief. I didn't care about this. It was more about the rules of Islam, and that's it. Yeah. Um... Okay, I'm going to leave, I'm not going to leave all the questions to you because I feel like this is all about you. Um, okay. Does that have any connection in Indian community by any chance? Canada is having so many Indian care. What does she think about them? I don't know Indians. I I just escaped one year ago. I uh, I went to a shelter. I've never met Indians. I went I went to two shelters actually, and I'm now living on my own since uh, July. I haven't met. Um, I haven't met any Indian. So. Sorry, I, I don't think I don't think we finished something, but there is a question that relates to it. Um, this is my favorite person, by the way, second favorite person, obviously after you. Um, um, so there is Ian's question that I will put up after this. Um, I just feel like this is this comes first in terms of like, did you tell your husband about you leaving Islam and how did he take that and his behavior as well? Yeah, I did tell him um, I was, was I still, no, I had my kid by then. Uh, I told him first, I thought like maybe I could actually start trusting him. Maybe I should try, you know, and I did. Uh, I remember it was in August, two years ago, in August. And um, he didn't take it well at all. And he used this. He started telling like people in my family, oh, you know, she left Islam to try to like get me back into it. And he thought maybe if I have the pressure of my mom and everyone else, I'm going to go back to Islam. He wasn't nice about it at all. So in front of me, he's like, I'm supportive. Don't worry. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to make you turn to Islam again. But please talk to the sheikh. Please listen to your mom. And he would bring them home against my will. Make, make me sit with them. Um, and I like I was even more control. Like I couldn't even decide who would come home and argue with me. I lost my voice at one point because I couldn't even like I had four people coming against me. 
and uh, supposedly he, he he's very manipulative he's like oh yeah I'm, I'm very with you i'm uh, supporting you don't worry i'm never letting anyone attack you but he's the one bringing all of these people to bash me uh so that was his response and i was like i don't want to live with you anymore i want a divorce and then he, we tried to work it out and then again i was like i don't want to live with you anymore because he kept again and again using my family against me uh telling them zahra is doing this zahra does this um, so at one point, for example, my mom was, when he first told her, like she left Islam, he went to meet her. It wasn't me who was, I, I, I didn't have the option of even telling my family that I left. He was the one to go and just tell everyone. He did whatever he wanted with this info about me. He didn't keep it to himself. He just wanted to tell it to everyone, you know? And so he went to my mom, he told her, and my mom was on her way. My mom was very physically abusive, just by the way. She was extremely physically abusive. Uh, so I was, I was really... I had my reasons to be afraid for my life. So I called the police and I told them, just wait outside. If anything happens, I'm going to go out. and Or if I yell or anything, you can, you can come in and help me. Uh, but other than this, like I didn't, I didn't say anything. Nothing else happened. I, my mom came. She just talked to me. Um, she was just like, she laid on the, the couch. She was like, you're killing me. And that was emotional manipulation. I'm not going to go into the details of what she said. But after a while, I just went outside. I told the police, nothing is happening. You can leave. Um, and he used this info, he knew that I called the police, he used this against me, he showed my mom, he was like, you know, she called the police, and he told my uncle and everyone, and they're like, oh my god, how dare she do this, how, how dare she's afraid of her, um, for her own life against an abusive mom who beat her up a lot during his li uh, her life. So this is how my husband reacted, he turned everyone against me even more, like he made them hate me even more. And uh, after a while, I just got enough. And I, I, thought, he, I, I thought maybe we could work it. Uh, but no, it didn't. Wow. I even told him at one point, can I leave the house without my hijab? Like, I'm, I'm openly an ex-Muslim. You told everyone. Why not? He's like, no, no, you have to dress as a Muslim. You have to behave as, as a Muslim. You're gonna, that's going to make you uh, come back to Islam. And how did you react to that? When I, did you remove the hijab? How did all I, of that come in I, place? I, I said that I was going to remove my hijab, but anyway, I didn't have anywhere to go. Every time we were supposed to go somewhere, and I was like, I'm leaving without the hijab, he's like, we're staying home, and he stays home. Wow, that's that's crazy. So when did you actually remove it then? Uh, the first day I left. So when you say you left, you mean physically leave then? I physically leave my ex, yeah. I, and I left, uh, what, what was that process like? Um... I decided like a week before this that I was going to leave. So I told my sister, my sister too, she's a, she, she left the house before I did. So she ran away from my mom. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, I, I want to leave too, but I need help because I have so many things to move. Uh, so I would put my stuff. Hiding. You were already on Twitter then. Yeah, I was on Twitter. Because I, I was, I was there and I checked up on you a few times. So, yeah. oh my God. Okay, cool. Um, Go on, sorry. Yeah, so I, I was I was on Twitter like way before I uh, at the beginning, really when I left Islam. That was when I opened my Twitter. Uh, but that was my old Twitter. I deleted it, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, I um, I decided like a week ago that I was gonna leave. I had the help of my sister and her boyfriend, and uh, like he helped with moving my stuff. He would come without my husband knowing my stuff. For like we lived in an apartment building, and I would put all my stuff like in the uh, last. Um, what is it called? There's like the first floor, but there's the basement. And mm -hmm. the, the stairs were like hidden. So I would mm -hmm. hide my bags and everything underneath. And my mm -hmm. ex was the type of husband who didn't know where the, the spoons and everything was in the house. So he wouldn't even notice that the half his house was empty. So that's how much I was the one responsible for him in every aspect. Um, so yeah, I emptied everything. My sister's uh, boyfriend at that time who would come and pick up everything and just moved. He sent me a message, everything is done. Two days later, I called the police. I was like, uh, I need to leave now. Uh, my husband is coming home. I, uh, I want to go. So they, they came, they called the, uh, they called the taxi, and they drove me with me to an, uh, a shelter, and that's where I stayed. There was a, a friend who suggested I can spend some days with her at her parents' house. She's Muslim, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, but I was like, she, she told me that they have Lebanese living in uh, across their street and I didn't want to expose her mm -hmm. or me like I don't know mm -hmm. what might happen to them yeah um if I was seen there so I was like no I'm sorry I'm gonna go I'm gonna have to leave for a shelter 
And uh, yeah, so I went to a shelter and uh, this is like how I left. Oh, I don't hear you. Somebody was opening through. Yeah, can you hear me now? Um, okay. Um, wow. Okay. So then you moved to the shelter. Um, I have a question before we get into your uh, shelter. So Ian's asking about circumcision and if your son did get circumcised and what did you plan to tell him if he did get circumcised or he didn't? Uh, he did, unfortunately. unfortunately. He, um, he got circumcised against my will, obviously. Uh, I was like, it doesn't make sense. And I was trying, like, I was an ex-Muslim back then, but I tried to, like, uh, uh, talk my ex out of it. So I was like, in, in the Quran, it's written that God created us perfect. Why do we need to chop this off? Why can't we wait for later? He's still a kid. What if something happens to him? I don't want to risk anything. Nothing did it. And I had, back then, my best friend, um, she was the one. She, she already had kids, so she called... My son was like one or two weeks old. She called her um, pediatri pedi pediatrician. Doctor? Yeah, whatever. I'm sorry, pediatr. Uh, I, I'm not good with like English pronunciation. So yeah, she called her uh, doctor, whatever. And she got me an appointment. And I thought it was because my son was sick. He had a hard time breathing. But no, it was uh, an appointment for um, a, a dick appointment, <laughs> whatever. It's, uh, dick appointment, circumcision. <laughs> yeah, they, they circumcised them. So, so your best there. friend betrayed you then? Uh, she was like, it's better to do it now. Like a few days before the appointment, I realized what it, what it was. And I was like, I, I didn't ask you for this. I want an appointment for my son because he's sick. He's having a hard time breathing. And she's like, but that's the perfect time for your son to get circumcised. And I just, wow. I couldn't talk to anyone else. I couldn't even tell my ex that. So I'm you were against it and you yeah. believe that you were strongly opinionated yeah. and believe that it is wrong. But I still it, had to do it. My ex like. Can, he can take my son basically anytime. Yeah. He just can leave in his car and do it without my will. Yeah. So. yeah. Personally, I didn't think about it until a couple of years ago because one, I don't have a child. Two, I'm not going to be in the position of that. But I had no strong opinions because I, I obviously I wasn't circumcised. Um, I say obviously, but I'm from East Africa. But yes. Um, but at the same time, like I never had to think about it. I know FGM was wrong, but I hadn't had to, had to think about it until I went to this conference and I realized. I can't be okay with this. Mm. Um, there is a question up here. I am not sure. Maybe. Um, I think most people I know, and I said it in my interview, are Sunnis that I met. Um, I have met, I am now meeting more Shias really in the last year, but the first people that I knew were Sunnis. Um, I have found that some like Salafis can be quite extreme and then some Shias can be quite extreme. And then there are the non-Salafis who are a bit more relaxed. Um, uh, Zara Kay and Zara, do you have religious Muslim friends? Yeah, I'll my like... friends are only Muslims. Okay. And Pidabis what is... Them very accepting. They know everything. They don't care. They're super okay. helpful. Okay, yeah, I, I have that too. A lot of my friends left, um, but then I am now making more friends. You know, some people, they put they put an arm's length or some people are like, well, I'm Muslim. I don't like that you blaspheme, but you have a right to your opinion. So some of them are acquaintances, some of them are close friends. Um, I can't obviously have, because a lot of my interactions now are more about in-depth thinking and like they go beyond just religion. So a lot of those values, I feel like I, I have some with some Muslim friends. But a lot of times I don't have that in common. Um, be it like even like dating or something else, I feel like I don't have that in common. Um, but I do help a lot of young Muslim girls. So I guess they're part of me, my faithless hijabi. Um, Why do more people find it disturbing? Why don't more people find it disturbing? Uh, probably because they don't hear about it much. And uh, it's not all Shia that do self-flagellation, honestly. Shia itself is a minority. You'll find a minority yeah. within this minority doing this. Like yeah. Khomeini, Khomeini, Khamenei, Muhammad Hassan, Fadlallah, I think not only Sistani allows it, but the yeah. others, they're all against. So flagellating yeah. or they're, even bleeding, no. But what about like Matam? Don't you, don't you just beat your chest in Muharram? You just beat your chest, that's it. Okay, yeah, so that was my family as well. But when I went to Iraq in Syria, I saw kids, their parents would have a sword. They had a big sword and they'd go and cut their forehead. Okay, and I was like, yeah. 
I have never seen something that crazy. And honestly, like a lot of my experience from then was like, these are bad. Like, I didn't even say they're bad Muslims. They're just like uneducated Muslims. Yeah. Um, so, sorry, I'm just trying to. Okay. Um, cheers to all if you're going to. Okay. This is for you. What did you do to compensate for loss of family in your life? It's nothing. I still have no one. I have my friends. Yeah. Uh, two of them. Uh, I, I, I have lots of acquaintances, but I have, I, I make a difference between saying friends and acquaintances. So in real life, I have two friends, two very good friends. They're mm -hmm. Muslims. But uh, acquaintances I have a lot, and being part of like XMNA, it's good. You meet like once a month or whatever. You mm -hmm. um, have loads of fun, uh, fun with them. It's a community. So you join a community. I think that's a good. It, it doesn't. It doesn't compensate fully, but it's still better than just being unknown. Yeah, I mean, we've done, I think we've done really um, well with the opening communities, bridging. Um, and contacting a lot of ex-Muslims, um, which is why Advice Corner would be great as well. Great to have you because I feel like you can share a breadth of different experiences. I, I, I would want to go in detail into like um, specifically not being able to study outside and coping with that and then being to where you were. Um, so this is a fun one. Have you eaten pork and drank alcohol to seal the deal? Yeah, the first thing I did when I uh, left Islam was eat pork the next day. I was out, yeah. my, I was out my ex-husband's place. Uh, no, it's not his place. It was my place too. So I was still with, I mean, I was still married. And uh, I find that what I would do is sometimes when he would give me money and I would get like the change, uh, I would keep it and I accumulated it uh, in the end and I got like uh, five, six dollars. And I went in secret in the morning. I would go straight away. There was like a grocery store right next to my place. I would go there. I bought my first pack of uh, bacon and I tried at home, which is funny is that I, I, I thought it's okay to eat it. I'm, I, it's bullshit, so I can eat it. Like it's the rules in Islam. But I kept washing my hands because I got the feeling that I was nijis. Yeah. So I was dealing with the bacon, I was like, ew, let's wash. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it also, like, when you cook bacon, it also smells differently. For, for me, I, um, I didn't eat pork for, like, two years. But even when I was, like, borderline Muslim, I had pork gelatin because I love dessert. And I realized yeah. that all desserts have it, but they don't write it. But because I worked in a company where they would write all allergies... It, and I was for like a year, I felt guilty. But then I'm like, I work in a company that gives you free food. How do I not have dessert? And I'm like, I was like, close your eyes, eat it. That's it. But like, it took me a year to actually like, even after I left, when I tried a bit of pork, I would immediately get a tummy ache. And I think that was anxiety because I was like, no, 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 it's wrong. Yeah, yeah, you can, you can get this. But for me, it was really easy. The moment I realized like I'm not a Muslim, I didn't care anymore. I, I, I ate whatever I wanted. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't mean that I eat too much outside. Yeah. It's not because I don't like it. It's um, it's not because I, I think it's like delicious. It's just I I don't like eating out. So yeah. I buy my own food. I like pork and everything. I cook it at home. I do it myself. And, and yeah, I drink does, it does your son um, eat pork? Uh, when he's with me here at home, yeah, he does. Okay. Um, there is a question that relates to this. Um, we would love some of your expertise with this. Oh, so because my, my ex and I, even though he was this way with me i i'm against when someone just doesn't let uh both parents see their kids so yeah. no matter what i wanted my ex to still see his son because mm -hmm. i came from a marriage where my mom just didn't allow my dad to see us mm -hmm. so 12 years not seeing your dad that's not what i wanted to make for my son so my son is like in between i have him for a few days my my ex have him uh also he's my son is the only one like no, like uh, my son is still in touch with my family. He goes there. They like him. Um, so he has this, he still have this religious uh, aspect in his life. Uh, what I want to make clear with my family and my ex is that if you do not feed him religious ideas now, when he's old enough, you can. 
but now no because like a few months ago i remember he went uh, once to my family and he heard something about god and he asked what does it mean he wanted to know uh he misunderstand everything and he came home and he was like uh uh, God, uh, we have to do, we ha uh, Baba have to pray because he has to make God happy. And I was like, who's God? And he said, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, which means <laughs> <laughs> he, got, he doesn't understand anything. So I told my ex, look, he, he, he doesn't have the brains to understand. So just don't talk about religion now. Let him grow. When he's in an age where he understands things, now you, you can, you can like introduce religion. I don't care if my son becomes a Muslim. I really want to mind him become Muslim, Christian, no matter what it is, I, I really don't give a fuck. As long as he doesn't join like Daesh or uh, any terrorist, uh, terrorist or organization. But other than this, I really don't give a fuck. Wow, um, that's, that's interesting. Um, I have a next question for you. Does going from believing God in some kind of divine plan to atheism with no promise to, uh, of afterlife create any new anxieties or conflicts with you? Not with me um some people they might have this and i think these are the people who for example you never had a dream in your life you never had a specific thank you goal. yeah you, you never had a specific goal so i i for example i was always into art i have a dream and a goal in my life and that's for example to make comics and i always focus on this when i lost my religion i didn't feel like i lost anything i still had my dream i still had like things i was looking up i want to reach this goal but when when you don't have any of that when you're just living your life normally you don't really have a very uh, like a, if your dream is just going to mecca or your dream is just like ending up in paradise then it means you don't have something on this earth you don't have anything you aspire like um it's a very empty life honestly so if you lose that you're gonna lose you're gonna have anxiety you're gonna lose, feel like you lost everything in your life so i i would say Find something like a goal you want to reach, and you're gonna feel less anxious. I, I, ha I had a, didn't have this experience. Yeah, um, I'm actually reading a, co a book called uh, "Man Searches for Meaning." Let me know if you like that. Um, it's a really good book. It's about uh, Viktor Frankl, who was in the concentration camp, a Jew, and he talks about how every man's meaning in life is different. Nobody can share the same one because you're unique. Your experiences are unique. And um, despite you know him, be, he was he wasn't anti-religious, but he talked about how people operate as a psychologist. He talked about it. So I think that's a really good work. Um, but personally for me, I'm actually really satisfied that I have this life and this is what I want to make most of. And I really don't want an afterlife because one, what we've been taught is hell and heaven and I don't like that. But even if that didn't exist, maybe let's say we all went to heaven and we were punished for some time. I just think that people can be so unfair in the concept of hell and ever, heaven, but um, I also have accepted that when other people die, they're dead and that is it. And I'm not going to see them again. As much as that hurts, because I lost my niece, you lost your aunt. Um, I feel like I am still very happy with having known her. And it's just something I have to accept. If I can't see her now, I don't want to hope for the future. Like, this is what I have. And this is what I want to make the more. So I really like your perception and like goal setting. Yeah. Um, I've definitely written down as like a topic I would like you to expand on. Um, I am not going to comment on this yet because I really want this to be in an advice corner also because both Zara and I have not lived in um, Islamic countries. Um, we have ties there and we've spoken to people there, but Zara, is there something you would like to add or do you want to wait for the advice corner where we can go in depth and maybe yeah. talk to got it as well um yeah, we actually came from this background exactly we lots of people women who came from this uh, these countries i think yeah. this is this should be directed to them yeah is your ex-husband still in canada yeah do you have a youtube channel no i don't i don't think i will ever have a youtube channel you can just come on mine or just yeah, we yeah. should do more of this this was really good maybe we should explore more topics um How did you feel when you finally realized that Islam wasn't true and they left it behind? Very liberated. I felt like I had a weight off my shoulder. Uh, my shoulder. Yeah. I felt like oh, I don't need to. Uh, it's not because of the laws of Islam themselves. It's more about when you have you when you're a Muslim and you have these uh, very problem problematic 
uh, verses or laws and you you are expected as a Muslim, you're a representative of your religion and you have people coming to you and be like, why do you have this in your religion? Why is this? Why is this? And you have to always um, like defend your religion. You, you have this, like you're a fighter. You, you're always like this jihad for your religion. And it's just like, I didn't want to always have to give excuses to what about like um, uh, the story of uh, Moses and uh, the, 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 the water opening and parting or whatever. All of this, I just couldn't make, re uh, make up excuses for this. And I was just so glad that I didn't have to, um, what's it called? Mental, um, not mental gymnastics. Mental gymnastics. Didn't another, have to um, endure. And then not the, there was another term. I forgot it. Uh, this not dissociation. Like when you, when you tell yourself, uh, for example, wearing the hijab is not a Stockholm syndrome. No, like you, t you say, wearing the hijab is not oppressive. It's not something that is uh, patriarchal. But you do acknowledge that wearing the hijab is something that is enforced by 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 men. internalized misogyny. Um, no, I forgot the term. I'm so sorry. Um, oh. That's a, I, th I think people understand like kind of mental gymnastic and stuff like this. I just yeah. I gave up all of this and I was I was free. I was so happy. Yeah. Um, cool. I am going to put you. Um, OK, um, I think this is the last question we'll take um, only because we're running short on time and we've gone to almost two hours. But what comics do you like to work on? me work on comics i don't know what you mean you said you liked to do draw comics or oh okay um yeah i like uh everything it could be funny it could be like a uh, comedy it could be action it could be um have you heard of SM physical do you draw them he's uh he's the father of my love. um yeah i do i draw uh i haven't I, seen any of your drawings you haven't but my no. my my Facebook uh, picture is actually drawn. I can do like poetry. I can do anything. Nice. Ooh. I'm going to check your Facebook right now. If I ever make uh, a comic, it's going to be of my experience in the shelter because I've met a lot of women and their story yeah. is really interesting. So going through like, um, I, I, I learned how to not judge by going to a shelter. It was like the best experience of my life and how I yeah. to, like uh, have confidence in myself. So I would make this into a comic. Yeah, nice. Um, and we're going to end it here. Do you have any last words for everybody watching? Do you have any advice? Or what is, how about, what is your one advice that you would give anybody, it doesn't have to be an ex-Muslim, um, that ever, I guess, that you think would benefit them? Uh, no pressure. Say, if you live in a Western country, you have all the tools it takes to leave. I had no diploma, I had no money at all. I had nothing. Yet I still managed to, like, I have an apartment now. I had a job. I went to university. I, I could do this because I'm in the West. So if you're in the West, you have the your government itself. You have the tools to just escape. So if you're really depressed, if you're not happy with your life, you want to leave, you can do it. And you should do it. Because, and it's also not for everyone, honestly, to just be very honest uh, with your family that you want to leave. Because you have to take into consideration that you might lose your family. So you have to consider this. If you are ready to lose everything, or if you know that your family is going to accept you, you should leave if you're okay with it. If you can't deal with the fact that you're going to lose your family and you're going to have no one, you should stay probably. Yeah. You're going to end up being very depressed and you're going to probably end up. Yeah, and like she said, it is dependent on how different families are. Mm -hmm. um, I think another Zara asked this. I only want to repeat, I only want to read this last question because I feel like um, we're not going to get many Shia women talking and I feel like this would this It's would a good help. positive question. Like, oh, yeah. good uh, Yes, I am so glad I was born into a Shia family and not a Sunni one, honestly. Uh, my, friends, my friends are Sunni and I remember one of them, she came to my place and she saw like I had, a, I had like an image of cats in my kitchen. Mm -hmm. She was like, that's haram because it's like imagery and you should know that too. I'm Shia, I don't give a fuck. I have this halal yeah. in my religion. I but was... I, yeah, I, I, liked, I liked in Muharram. I don't know if you have this too. We do something called hrisi. It's a food that we do during Muharram. It's mm -hmm. so good. The food during like these occasions, it's it's just really good. And also the the like what is it like community. porridgey and sticky? Yes. Yeah, With, we have uh, that too. Barley, I don't know. 
Oh gosh, I love it. I, I don't know what it's called, but my dad used to make it. So my dad used to be a mosque chef. He sometimes maybe does it. I'm not sure. But that's how everybody in Tanzania know me. Um, and he used to make it. And it was always very different when you make it at home and when you make it in the mosque. The mosque food, my dad used to cook for the mosque a lot. But like even when he made it at home, it was just different. Mm -hmm. um, so I really like that food part. I really, I, I like the community part. Um, yeah. Except I came from a very bitchy community, so <laughs> you think the uh, monies are not bitchy? <laughs> oh, I I don't like. Yeah, I don't know. Like in my community, like just people have to know it. So if some like we have thirty-seven people, but if people don't know, my uh, Wikipedia page is actually being shut down because uh, somebody has just been attacking it. We are trying to restore it. So if somebody wants to give us hands on it, um, ideally, I want, regardless of the Wikipedia page, I really want Faithless Ajabi to always stay there. So if somebody wants to contribute, knows people, contacts, please let us know. Um, I want Faithless Ajabi to, if it's not me, to somebody else to have this conversation, somebody else doing it. And even if I do it on the background, I don't care. I just want it to go on even after me. And I feel like people will want to join and contribute. Um, but yeah, um, so I guess in terms of that, that community was like, they want me erased. Um, I'm not even kidding. Um, they've shunned me. Uh, they've been horrible to my brother, my family. Um, but yeah. Sorry, that's enough about me. But we are going to end this chat. Uh, thank you for joining our first episode. Um, if you miss this podcast or have just joined in, her story is amazing. Like, especially after the 15 minute mark, Zara gets fired up and she's like, I'm gonna own this world. <laughs> and I love that. Um, I love that I she got she got comfortable and she spoke and we will have her again and we're going to have her on advice corners as well. Inshallah, inshallah. Inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, so please go follow her on Twitter. She's amazing. And please show us more of your art, um, especially if you want to draw for Faithless Jabi. Why not? <laughs> yeah, no, please. Like, it will be credited to you. But I just want, like, a lot of people expressing themselves through art, but also, like, um, being more creative. So people do poetry, um, music. Um, I just feel like it'll be great to have different forms of expression. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And people can relate to you because they'll connect to you that way. Mm. If they like your art, they're going to be like, hey, who is this person? And then look up about you. And they're like, oh, my God, I like art. So does she. I feel like when younger people connect to you, they grow up to take you as role models like your sister. And I want to get into that later on. But thank you so much for watching. It was so nice to have you. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for having me. It was an honor, honestly. I'm so glad. Yeah, this is amazing. Oh my God, I can talk to you for like another three hours. <laughs> I, I, feel, I, I feel the last time we did it, we talked for like two hours, I think. On the phone, me and you? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we really, talked yeah. about, yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.